quickly. Lord, you said and you proclaimed, ask and it will be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. Everyone, you said, who asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him who knocks, it will be open. What a God you are. What grace you offer, Lord, people like us. Tonight, Lord, we are just longing for once more the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives, Lord, in our families, in our church, our fellowship, our community, Lord, your world. We avail ourselves tonight, Lord, our eyes and our ears, our hearts and our minds, our hands and our feet, our wallets, God. We just want to give ourselves to you. In light of your goodness, in light of your grace, your mercies, God, which never stale, Lord, but they're new every single morning. You have a new angle, Lord, a new something of mercy to speak to us and shower on us, Lord. God, you are incredible. And as we begin a study tonight, Lord, here in Judges chapter 1, we're going to see how incredible you truly are. Your grace, Lord. Your kindness that leads us to repentance. You're very clear. You speak the truth to us and you say the wages of sin is death. Lord, it destroys, it creates dysfunction. We see that in Judges. And we see so clearly with that, Lord, our failure, our inability, Lord, to be faithful to you. Let every mouth be stopped, God. As Paul said to the Romans, all, let all be under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. There is none good, no, not one, but God. You who are so rich in mercy, abounding in love, you hear every single cry that we make. Lord, when we call with a sincere heart, Lord, turning from sin, repenting of our ways, God, you redeem and you restore every single time. The power of the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the good news of grace that just keeps getting better and better. Minister that grace to us tonight. Lord, as you say that it's the love of Christ that compels us to live for you, to give to you, to serve you. Lord, we need to see your grace. We need to sense and feel your love. We need to receive some mercy, God that we could be a people who choose to be set apart for you, Lord. Engaging in what is the privilege of our life, the purpose thereof, and that's, Lord, your service. To be salt and light, Lord, to introduce the world through our actions, Lord, and our words, who you are and what you've done. We are so thankful to be here, Lord. We thank you and we rejoice together with your people that we have the privilege to come and worship you, Lord, meet you here in the sanctuary. Open your word together and just study, Lord, through the Old Testament verse by verse, God, and just enjoy each and every place. Help us to hear from you tonight, to see Jesus, to celebrate the good news, and to grow, God. Where are we going, Lord, if we're not growing? as your heart for us as your disciples is to grow, God, from infants, from babes into mature adults. Grow us a little bit, Lord, more tonight, a little further, God. We thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come upon us. This is not a physical meeting. This is not a self-help group. This is not a ministry of man. And if it is, God, we don't want to be here. We have the privilege of meeting with Almighty God as we open your word. 
So we're expecting, we're anticipating tonight, God. We're hungering and thirsting for Jesus. Meet with us, change us, and make us more like you. How thankful we are for your word tonight. Magnify the importance of your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen. And we say, amen. You may be seated. Judges 1, verse 1. We had a blast. I had a a fantastic time studying through Joshua. It seemed to go by so fast, 24 short chapters, but it's a book that's exciting. It's filled with victory. It's all about a redeemed people ensuring that their hearts are right before the Lord living by faith, entering into the promised land, and as we apply that to ourselves as New Covenant Christians, we see so many references to and we learn so much about what we might call the promised life. Amen? Joshua. Is my mic loud enough? Don't make me shout. I'll lose my voice. Joshua. It's a book filled with victory, a humble, obedient people just entering into the fullness of God. Amen? So much there for us to be excited about. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but if you haven't read Judges, Judges ain't no Joshua. Amen? It spans a long period of time, about 400 years of Israel's history. We see seven cycles in the book of Judges, and not one of them are very good. It's the same cycle over and over again with God's people, and we see so much of ourselves and our character and our nature, who we are, apart from the Lord, and how much we need Jesus Christ. In Judges, as a man, it's a stark contrast. We see a rebellious people. We see an idolatrous people. We see a people who have been given everything, and yet because they they didn't do business as the Lord told them to and taught them that they should, remove all and every form of, of sinful influence, what we might call idolatry, get it out of your house, kick it out of your nation, have nothing to do with the activities and habits and substances that the the nations around you are are, are so into and and so are are allowing into their lives and are such a part of their lives. You're to have nothing to do with these things because God's people then said, in this place of privilege, well, we don't really need to listen to the wisdom of the word, do we? We don't really need to, you know, deal with sin that brutally As Jesus taught us, if your right hand causes you to sin, man, cut it off. If your eye causes you to stumble into sin, pluck it out. Now he's not being literal, amen? Amen? Very important, I think, sometimes. He's teaching us to deal drastically with sin. If your TV makes you stumble, put a a shovel through it. Huck it over the fence. If the internet causes you to fall into sin, cancel it. You'll live without it. That was, a, that was a great, you know, contemporary joke, I think. You'll live without the internet. We can make it without the internet. Amen? If driving by that store compels you to stop and to pull in and to buy some of this or partake of some of that, whatever it is, if walking by her desk or his cubicle causes you to be tempted, man, quit your job. Ooh, that's radical. Yeah, deal drastically with sin. And because God's people refuse to to do that, we see the book of Judges. Its title bears the name of its central subject, and it's really God's faithfulness. We'll talk about a few other things as we introduce this a little bit tonight. But its title again, and it's believed to have been written down by Samuel. You can look into that for yourself. But its title is is centered around the faithfulness of God as Israel went through these cycles of seeking the Lord and being right with God and worshiping the Lord and yay, things were hunky-dory, they were good, you know. They were blessed, they were in fellowship with God. No consequences were coming down on them by their sin. And yet, little by little, they slipped away in church attendance. Well, it was kind of spotty, a daily devotional. Well, who really needs to do that? Little by little, the spiritual disciplines, as it were, 
left their schedules. And God became less and less of a priority and idolatry, as that will always be the case. The author of Hebrews and, and 1 Peter warns us against drifting away from the Lord. And it, and it happens so quickly, so, so easily in the tides of this world. We just drift away from the Lord so easily. Unless we're pressing forward, unless we're digging our feet down into the sand. Amen? These cycles of drifting away from the Lord. And then when the consequences of sin came, and they always do, right? Beware, be sure, the Bible says your sin will find you out. It will chase you down and humiliate you, expose you, shame you. And if it can, it will kill you. We're teaching through judges in our devotion at home. And it was Samson the other night. And boy, I tell you what. (laughs) If we don't see that so clearly in the life of Samson. How sin shames us and humiliates us and takes everything from us, even as Christians. And that's Satan's desire for us, to sift us as wheat. What an expression. To crush us and strangle us and cut us off from God's blessing. Consequences come. But then like a, like a glorious, you know, trumpet blast, however that relates to you, uh, as soon as the moment comes where God's people cry out in repentance, not just the sorry syndrome, oh, I'm sorry that I have circumstances, and we see that here, but truly saying sin stinks and the wages are and always will be death, it was so good, as the prodigal said, back in my father's house. I'm going to get out of this lifestyle Stop making these choices, justifying idolatry, sinful living, and I'm going to repent and come back to the Lord. I'm going to leave sin behind and come back to the Lord. Every single time, over and over again, we see God's faithfulness to raise up a judge. And when you think of that expression, it's, it's shofet in the Greek, or shofat, we might say. But it's not a, a dude or a lady who wears black robes and swings a gavel. It's a savior, it's a hero, it's a deliverer. And there are many synonyms um, for this word in the Hebrew, and those are a few. It's the, the trumpet blast, God is on his way, he raises up a redeemer who brings God's people and ushers them out of the consequences of sin, clean them up, set them straight, things are good and glorious again, there's fellowship and, you know, the highs of the Christian life, as it were, we might say, though this is Old Covenant, back in fellowship with God. The Lord is so faithful. And yet, sadly, because we are an imperfect people, folks, and that's saying it lightly, amen? They sadly repeated the same mistake over and over again. Couldn't help but think today, as I had some time to look into this, that in part, the book of Judges is a book of mourning. And that's, you know, not when the sun rises, right? But M-O-U-R, amen? A book of mourning, because when we look into the book of Judges, we just find ourselves a little somber, a little sad. We find ourselves mourning a little bit about what we see. And more than just what we see, someone else's story, we see ourselves, we see those that we love, and our hearts are kind of saddened. Uh, In Judges, we see the wages of sin, that they're death. We see the consequences that come. We see the the price of just foolish choices. And our hearts, you know, grieve. They mourn a little bit over those things. And I pray that we remember, as that observation is made, that mourning is not always a bad thing. Amen? Think it through for just a moment. We mourn for lots of reasons in life. I think principally, you know, when a person dies, we mourn for the loss of that person. There are so many people mourning now for just the, the destruction of the, um, the fires, you know, in our, in our region, our area here, and the loss of home and everything, and people who, you know, have finally gotten back to where their house used to be, and it's just nothing but a pile of ashes, and there's, there's just nothing remaining. And all those, you know personal items that can't be replaced at that point are lost, and there's, there's a mourning that takes place. There's a heartbreak. 
But I think principally, we as believers, and especially those of us that are leaders, as we bear the load of our brothers and sisters, we walk side by side with fellow Christians, we're ministers in the workplace, and every other opportunity, we are seeking to shoulder our brothers and sisters literally into the kingdom of God. Um, it's when we see the wages of sin, the consequences of foolishness, man, it just breaks our heart. And a certain sobriety takes place in mourning uh, to whatever you know, end or whatever reason for which our, our mourning comes, how mourning clarifies the essentials of life. Amen? Think that through for a minute. Mourning clarifies or makes clear to us the essentials of life, like what's important and what matters most. And it's in this mourning, it's through the book of Judges that, I tell you what, our spiritual life is 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 clarified to a laser beam isn't it we see so very clearly our spiritual priorities and here's just a few maybe four things that we're going to see and learn from this book of mourning pick up over and over again through these stories in the book of judges maybe we'll go quickly i don't know depends on how bummed out you are every wednesday but it's a profitable study for these, let's say, four reasons. Firstly, we're going to see the character and nature of man so clearly. We delude ourselves all the time, don't we? We think of ourselves more highly than we should. And that's why the Bible says don't do that. Do not think highly of yourself at all. Keep your eyes on Jesus. You know, that's going to keep you encouraged. That's going to remind you how far from him truly we are. And yet, through his grace... We become a thankful, grateful, humble, obedient people. We're going to see the, the flaws in our character so very clearly. Who we are, our habits, our tendencies. And so it produces in us, or at least it should, a, 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 a choice to live a careful life. Right? I don't trust me. How about you? That's a trick question. Don't say yes. Because if you do, you shouldn't. And that's what we're going to learn from the book of Judges. We could go on and on. Secondly, we're going to see the character and nature of God. The grace of God is something that I cannot get over. Hasn't gotten old yet. We talk about it a lot. Because if there's a central subject that our lives as Christians is to be about, it begins and ends with grace. Grace is the foundation of the gospel and, and so much more for we Christians. Grace is what keeps us coming back, turning and repenting from sin, knowing that the Lord will receive us as we do so. And all these things, it's the grace of God that we see poured out. It's just everything for we Christians. The character and nature of God. The fact that He hears us. You think it's significant that there are seven cycles in the book of Judges? If you've been with us on Sunday morning, through Revelation thus far? I hope you say, no, I don't think it's coincidence, but I think it's significant, right? Seven, some would say, representing completion. In the Scripture, we see it over and over again. Though a righteous man may fall, you remember? Seven times, every single time, the Lord hears and He restores when we come with repentance. And that's amazing to me. We could go on and on, but we'll see it so clearly. Thirdly, I pray we pick this up. I pray this is cemented in our hearts and minds as Christians. I know I need it to be in my life. Thirdly, we're going to see that sin can never satisfy. Sin sells itself so well, doesn't it? Pretty little packages. There's always like theme music for sin. TV, just man, we believe whatever we see on television. In the movies, we just, we soak that stuff in, we suck it up, and we just believe it. Sin sells itself in so many successful ways. And it says, you know, really just one thing, doesn't it? Satisfaction lies here. And it's a lie. Amen? It's a lie. And we don't have to live in Christ too long to see that the wages of sin is indeed death. So to the flesh, as Paul said, 
Live after the lusts of the flesh and you're going to reap death, corruption. Your life is going to begin to fall apart piece by piece. Zombie time, right? Is that contemporary? Very quiet. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Sin says that it can satisfy. It never does and it never will. And it has a way of stripping our soul away from us like peeling an onion, the Proverbs declare. And the longer we live in it, the less of ourselves we seem to see. Sin can never satisfy. We see that in Judges. Lastly, fourthly, we see the priority that God's Word mm, is to be in our lives. The foundation that the Word of God must and always be for we Christians. And Jesus taught us that, didn't He? Is that rain? Praise God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah! <laughs> That's grace, folks. How essential God's Word is for we Christians. We get caught up in that temptation. I've heard it. I've read it. I know it. But yet the Lord says, continue in it. Write it on your hearts. Memorize it. Bind it on the back of your hands. Whatever it takes just to remember it, to rehearse it, to be washed and cleansed by it, how we need God's Word. It alone is a firm foundation for our, our life. It alone is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. It alone is spiritual food. It's the only thing in existence that is sustenance, spiritually speaking, Milk and meat, like milkshakes and butter and all that good stuff, you know, the sweet stuff. And then the stuff you got to chew on, you know, for a while. I won't mention food anymore, I promise. How we need God's Word. And we could reference Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. So those four things we're going to see so clearly. Practical, profitable lessons in the book of Judges. And I pray that through so studying, our, our mourning could be turned to dancing. Amen? That's, that's, a, that's a good comparative text. Our gloom into joy as we see all these wonderful, important, profitable lessons that come from judges. Folks, you don't have to go through it yourself. Do you know that? You don't have to take the hard road. You don't have to, to dive into the ditch and see how deep you can get. But you can listen to the wisdom that comes from someone else's errors and mistakes. You don't have to bear the same scars. And I'm so thankful for that as a Christian. Hear the word of the Lord. Receive it. Commit it to your heart. Practice it in your life. And that life will be a whole lot more joy-filled. Amen? Judges begins the first two chapters kind of an interesting way. And Hebrew writing is kind of all of, it kind of just flows in that kind of manner. Chapter 1, it seems we're continuing right where we left off. Though there's some repetition, some information we've already covered in chapter 1. And then chapter 2 kind of goes all the way back to before Joshua died and, and what took place. So the first chapters are kind of unique. You're going to see some similarities between what we've studied in Joshua, but hey, we'll cover it anyway, maybe a little quickly. Let's start reading now chapter 1, verse 1, all that being said. We believe Samuel to be writing these things and recording them. Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? There's a lot here in this little verse. Underline it if you want to, but this is a significant moment, frankly, of, of sadness for many reasons in Israel's history. Joshua died, and we covered that. We closed the book of Joshua. You can look back up and read a little bit into that last section and, and see the recorded history that's there. Israel served the Lord, verse 31 of Joshua 24 says, Serve the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. What an effect 
a single life can have. What an effect a godly example can be. An example of uncompromising choices. That's what Joshua seems to kind of sum up for us, right? A man who said over and over again, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is what we're going to do. This is the word of the Lord, and this is how we're going to respond to it. I pray you join us in that, he always said. And we covered that last time. Israel served the Lord faithfully, walked with him in holiness and obedience, and bore the blessing of those wise choices all the days of Joshua's life. But a time is coming, and we'll see that, second half of chapter 2, and into the rest of the book of Judges, when because Joshua was gone, you know, they just didn't really take their relationship with the Lord all that seriously. It's tough when a leader, and we can look back in church history, we can look back all the way, frankly, to the book of Genesis, can't we? And just see and say that it's tough when a good, godly, uncompromising, faithful leader moves on, dies, goes to heaven. Now, I don't think they say that. That's not their testimony, right? It's like, yes, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm in heaven. That was a little, little, little joke there. But at any rate, the ones that are left behind are the ones who experience sadness and maybe suffer a little bit. There's a hole that's left. And think this through. You know, Moses was the one that God used to take God's people out, the Exodus, out of Egypt and head towards the promised land. And before they crossed the Jordan into it, Moses went to heaven and Joshua was commissioned to bring God's people in, a parallel of Jesus, cross the Jordan into the promised life, into the promised land, conquer the major cities and strongholds, the biggest armies, and, and then leave, as we'll see shortly again, the smaller sections for each tribe to take for themselves. It was their opportunity to partner up with the Lord individually, every single tribe, and take their possession. Joshua fulfilled his commission, and yet such a, a hole was left. His example was gone. I'm so thankful that our lives oftentimes can be so short. There's a lesson there, spiritually speaking. We are those as people who get so caught up with personalities and people and we seem to like attempt to hang our faith on a person as opposed to clinging to Jesus Christ. Amen? God doesn't let us do that. Man, he'll just take them home, you know? And it's our privilege, it's our opportunity at that time to reassess our faith and find where it's hanging. Is it on our parents? Is it on our pastors? Is it on someone else? It can only be attached to the person of Jesus Christ. This is a tough transition for God's people, and it's tough because we see all the failures that come. And so some will look at this and say, well, it's God's fault, you know? There was no replacement for Joshua. I mean, uh, 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 no forethought there, God. And I stand away from those kinds of people because if lightning strikes them, you know, I, I don't want to get hit by it. Amen? This is not an impossible situation. This is a godly transition. Not an impossible circumstance, but a godly decision. And it's tough without question, but listen, as we see God's intended plan for his people, they were not to have a king. They were not to have, it was Moses leading them out and to Joshua bringing them in and now the, the gears are being shifted and God is designing a new sort of experience for his people and, and that is for them to come directly to him. They have his word, don't they? They have the priest, as we'll see shortly, need some pointers, need to seek the Lord. The priest was there. They've got the word, they've got the priests, and so coming to the Lord, hearing from him, living for him, serving him, staying in his blessing, avoiding idolatry, I mean, all that was right there for them. But that, of course, is a choice that every single one of us must make. We are entering into, as it were, the season of personal responsibility. And that's a privilege, isn't it? Isn't that one of the greatest privileges of our Christian life? You don't need a parent. You don't need a pastor. 
You don't need an author. You don't need anybody. You get to come directly to the Almighty, our great high priest, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. And it's through him that we, we access that fellowship with God that, that John talks about in his epistle. It's incredible. You don't need anybody. That's God's best for you. That's his heart for you. That's his intention for you. No Moses, no Joshua, no replacement is made here. A judge is going to come on the scene soon, but then go right off the scene, right? Because the point of this season, listen, is personal responsibility and how that relates to our Christian life today, amen? Joshua died, bummer, man. Good men are hard to find. Strong, uncompromising leaders, they're rare. But the season that God is intending for his people to enter into is one, just frankly, of glory. So verse 1, after the death of Joshua, the children of Israel, you know, started well. You remember what he told them to do. He said, as each one of you is, have, have received your allotment, your piece of property, as it were, you're part of the promised land. Now it's your time to branch off from the main group, head for that parcel, that piece, conquer it, and enjoy your relationship with the Lord that he's provided to you in his grace and through his mercy. Enjoy life as you press out the people, those idolatrous influences who continue to live there. This was their time. This was their opportunity. The potential for God's blessing sat before them. And, you know, this is great. We're going to see Judah is the first one that the Lord commissions to go to battle in their particular piece of the promised land. And this is great. They start well. They're following the instructions of Joshua here. And I like what we see in verse 1 and 2. Joshua's dead. The children of Israel are there. And they asked the Lord, Who shall be the first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? We might wonder how they sought the will of God. And it's very simply... Seen through the ministry of the priests, no doubt they went to the high priest. And you can flip with me to Numbers 27, verse 21, for a biblical reference. Numbers 27, verse 21. Went to the priest and sought God's prescribed method at that time, the Urim and the Thummim. And, you know, ascertained at this time what the will of the Lord was. Numbers 27, verse 21. The Lord starts speaking to Moses. Moses cries out to the Lord. God speaks. References the priesthood. And how God's people would seek his will. Verse 18, the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Set him before the high priest. Inaugurate him. Appoint him. Give some of your authority to him. And here's what we see in verse 21. He shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall inquire before the Lord for him by the judgment of the Urim. At his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, he and all the children of Israel with him, all the congregation. And so Moses did what God said. Simply enough, they head for the priest, Judges 1, ascertain what the will of the Lord is through those, those means which we still don't fully know what they are. And we can talk about that later or not because there's no relation in that for us today. Amen? I like that. But the people went to the priest, ascertained the will of the Lord so very simply. They still had work to do. They were seeking to engage in that work. And the Lord said, verse 2, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the land into his hand. Unlimited potential in God. I mean, we've seen that over and over through Joshua. It's the lesson of faith that we must appropriate into our lives, right? You have your calling in, in God through Christ Jesus. 
Go into all the world and make disciples of, of all nations. Unlimited opportunity. I'll go with you. In fact, I've gone before you. Let's do this. I love it. The opportunity is ours. But it's a choice that we will make, as we'll go on to see with this nation, as we observe ourselves. I like this verse 3 also. Note this with me. So Judah said to Simeon his brother, Come up with me to my allotted territory that we may fight against the Canaanites. And hey, let's form a partnership. I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. First of all, we note that God's people had no problem hearing from him at all when they saw him, right? No problem hearing from him at all when they saw him. And that's the distinction, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful that James teaches us in his epistle, chapter 1, if any among you lacks wisdom, any of us tonight, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. He won't make you feel like a dummy when you come. And God, I, I don't know. He won't make you feel bad. But he'll just speak words of wisdom to you. How easy and simple it was for God's people to understand and apply God's wisdom, God's word to their lives, to hear his voice to find his will. And it's only better for us today as Christians. Amen? Why did we pray as we began tonight the goodness, the grace, the mercy of God? Ask and it will be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone, Jesus said, everyone who asks and seeks and knocks, you're going to get it. That's incredible. What an invitation that is. And what a privilege we have as Christians that every area of our lives can benefit from the wisdom and will of God. All we need to do is ask. What do you need clarification on? What do you need wisdom for? Counsel. I mean, anything that you need, God promises to give it. What does Proverbs 3 say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's key, isn't it? God, I, I trust you. When I come to you, you're going to speak to me. I, I trust that. You say you will, and so I'm going to come to you. I'm going to seek you with my whole heart. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own understanding. That means what you think you know, throw it away. And pray that way. God, I don't know anything. I'm a big, giant, bearded dummy. Let's start over, God. I have no education, not really. I have no qualification. My experience means nothing. I just, I cast anything that I could have to the side in a way. I want to hear from you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not. Don't do it. Your own understanding. Well, this is what I did last time, or this is what works, or this is what makes sense, or this is what others say, you know. Just throw it all away. Lean not on your own understanding. And then it goes on. In all your ways, acknowledge him. I like that. What's your intended plan and purpose in all your ways, in everything you do? Okay, what does God's word say about that? And is this a proper venture? Is this a biblical, you know, kind of expedition? Whatever the case may be. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Is God ruling over every area, every part of my life? Am I submitted and surrendered to the truth of his word? Then the proverb concludes, and he will direct your paths, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your paths. He'll direct your paths. He'll tell you where to go and how to get there and every other such thing. But those priorities have got to be in place if we want to hear from the Lord. You know, we're created to be a dependent people. We are created to be a dependent people. Some don't think that's good news. Some wish that were not the case. But we're going to learn in Judges. Let me tell you something, right? This is a Judges joke. <laughs> You're going to see how truly in need we are. 
of a rock. What a great need we have for a foundation. We are a people that have been created to need Jesus Christ. And we grow in that understanding the more we kind of get to know the Lord and, and, and ourselves through the Word, don't we? Man, how I need a rock and a fortress, a strong tower to run to and frankly live in. How easy it is for us to hear the will of God. What He wants us to do. If we'll listen to it. If we'll seek it with our whole heart. We'll benefit from it. Amen? God speaks. Judah gets ready to go. But here's what He does. He partners up with Simeon. Beautiful partnership. Nothing inappropriate about it at all. When our Lord Jesus sent out his disciples, the 70, he sent them two by two, you remember, in pairs. Ecclesiastes 3 talks about that. Two are better than one, right? I mean, it just makes sense for so many reasons. And so too in the church today, in the work of the ministry. Uh, what, a, what an opportunity we have not to walk alone, pioneer our own path and do our own thing, but, but partner up with God's people to do his work, it's a beautiful thing. Lean on each other, benefit from the gifting and experience and so on and so forth of our brothers and sisters. Well, Simeon liked the sound of that. He agreed, verse 4. We'll start moving a little quickly. Then Judah went up and the Lord delivered. Make sure you highlight that and underline this. And the Lord delivered, just like he said he would. He delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands and they killed 10,000 men at Bezek. It was a huge, major victory. And they found the king of this particular area, Adonai Bezek, and that means in the Hebrew, Lord of Lightning. Is that interesting? As we're going to see in a moment, this was a, you know, a, a big bad dude, a rough and tough fella. The Lord of Lightning, that was his title. Self-appointed, no doubt. So they found this king, having, you know, beaten his army, in Bezek, fought against him. They defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Then the king fled, and they pursued him and caught him. And this is radical, right? They caught him. The book of Judges, by the way, is a little brutal. It's got, it's got like a PG on it, right? They caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Now, this is a common practice in the land at that time. But this is not a common practice among the nation of Israel. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Think about it. You are eliminating an opponent by cutting off his thumbs and big toes. He can't hold a sword. He can't run after you. So you are completely and absolutely conquering, you know, this, this opposing enemy. But this is a new thing for Israel. It seems kind of crazy. It seems kind of out of character for Israel. They've never done anything like this before. We're not going to really read about it again. Again, Judges is brutal. But nonetheless, this is a kind of unique circumstance. And it seems kind of out of character until we read the next verse. I don't know if you flip the page there, but my Bible does, so it's like totally like poetic. Turn the page and read verse 7. And here's the explanation. And Adonai Bezek, this king, the Lord of Lightning, right? said this, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to gather scraps under my table. Right? 70 kings he conquered. And he cut them up and made them, you know, dogs and slaves. Gather scraps underneath his table. That's how they lived. That's what he did to them. And here's his testimony. And this is radical to me. As I have done, so God has repaid me. Then they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. He didn't live. Israel didn't do to him what he did to these other 70 kings. As I have done, so God has repaid me. Not, bummer, Israel beat me. Judah, Simeon, man, they're formidable foes, and they conquered me and did this to me. What does he say? What's his testimony? This is divinely inspired scripture. This is the word of God, right? As I have done, so God has repaid me. As we've talked about previously, 
Israel uniquely, uniquely at this time, is God's form of divine judgment against these idolatrous na nations. He says, 400 years I gave them to repent of these terrible, just wicked, horrible things. Things that if you looked at and saw today, you'd say, God, how can you not do anything about that? When is righteousness coming? When is judgment coming? That has to stop. Uh, just the slaughter of, 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 of enemies and babies and practices and all the things we've talked about. The idolatrous cultural practices. God gave them space to repent, gave them opportunity, refused, and so judgment through Israel was, was coming. And uniquely, this doesn't exist still today. There's no type or comparison for the church. Uniquely, Israel was God's form or instrument of divine judgment to come in and clean house. And that's exactly what this guy testifies of here. But here's what I like about that. Israel didn't know it, right? Israel, you know, the, the, the folks there in, in Judah and Simeon, well, let's cut this guy's toes off and his thumbs, you know? This is something that it would surely seem as we read here and according to the declaration of this king that Israel did kind of without knowing it. They just did it and God used it. And that's an incredible thing. Moving his people to accomplish his end kind of without their even being aware of it. God had something to say to this man. And it was, you are now being judged as I have done, so God has repaid me. This is divine justice, and I deserve it. This is judgment, and it's right. We're going to read as we get into Revelation 6 through 19, the great tribulation, the wrath of God, the wrath of the Lamb. And over and over we read the testimony from heaven, true and righteous are your judgments. And when we see from heaven the wrath of God being poured out, I mean, all of heaven agrees and testifies, yep, it's not too much, it's not too little, it's, it's just right. This is what the crime deserves. This is the sentence for the crime that was committed. True and righteous are your judgments. And that's what we see here. As I have done, so God has, has repaid me. This is righteous. And this is from the Lord. Apparently, again, without Joshua, God's people were fine, right? They could seek his will through the priest. He could even kind of turn and direct their hearts as he prophetically sees fit to his intended end? It's a beautiful thing, a good reminder. Amen? Verse 8, Now the children of Jiz, uh, uh, Judah, and we've read this several chapters in Joshua, Joshua 15 especially, we've covered all this recently, so we're kind of going to speed our way through it, wrap it up for tonight. Now the children of Judah fought against Jerusalem and took it. They struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. We'll read additional commentary about that in a minute. Afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who dwelt in the mountains in the south, the lowland. Then Judah went out against the Canaanites who dwelt in Hebron. The name of Hebron was formerly Kirjath Arba. They killed these three giants, Shishai, Ahiman, Talmai, from there, they went out against the inhabitants of Debir, verse 12. You remember this, this glorious moment. We'll watch the video in heaven someday, you remember? Then Caleb said, this is history for us, Joshua 15. It's kind of being interwoven and inter, uh, intermingled here. Then Caleb said, whoever attacks this city and takes it to him, I will give my daughter as wife. One man, you know, heard the call, took the challenge, responded, and Othniel, the first judge of Israel, by the way, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, so he gave him his daughter as a wife. We read this also. Now it happened when she came to him that she urged him to ask her father for a field, some property, this newlywed couple, right? And she dismounted from her donkey, and, and Caleb said to her, what do you want? An invitation for even more. So she said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have given me land in the south. For me and my new husband, give me also springs of water. Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs in that area. Caleb was an incredible, unique guy. He kept his vitality, his strength, without medication. 
He, he kept his vitality, his mental clarity, his, his ability physically because he never stopped swinging the sword. He was faithful. And as we've talked about in this specific section previously, not only was he an incredible guy personally, but he created opportunity for his replacements, the young folks, the next generation. He created opportunity for them to excel and we see that here. Whoever takes the city, I'm going to give him my daughter as a wife. And so just a beautiful form of discipleship there. And then again, as we talked about, we see his daughter just, just asking. Asking her father for this and that and, and the best that he could give. Spurgeon called this portion of Scripture a parable on prayer. And we talked about that how we can and should and must ask God for big things. I said a meeting this week with um, some people and some folks and regarding some ministry here in Sacramento and just the call for prayer to just radically ask God for what his word says he'll do and to not stop asking until we see him do it. To be radical and to pray prayers of faith. You have not because you ask not. And sometimes you don't get what you ask for because you're asking with wrong motives, James says. So ask of God. Verse 16, now the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up from the city of Palms with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the south near Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. And Judah went with his brother Simeon. So now we see the partnership in play. And they attacked the Canaanites who dwelt or who inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. So the name of the city was called Hormah. And Judah took Gaza with its territory. This is Philistine land. Ashkelon with its territory. Ekron with its territory. So the Lord, verse 19, so the Lord was with Judah. And they drove out the mountaineers, the hill folks. But they could not, the contrast is here, and we've covered this previously, but they could not drive out the inhabitants of the lowland because they had chariots of iron. Successful in one particular area and not successful in the other. Requires the same faith. It's the same God, right? And yet certain things are more difficult for us than others. The hill folks, they were all good, but the, the lowland, the chariots, they were intimidating, whatever the case may be. It wasn't that they could not, it was that they would not. And we've talked about that. God promises the victory, but he seeks a partnership with you and me. And that's our great privilege as Christians. We'll see the power of God doing the miraculous. When we step out into the work to which the Lord has called us and do so faithfully. And yet this is the testimony that we've talked about and that we're going to go on to see the refusal because it's difficult, because it's hard, because it requires more labor, or maybe just that, that, that discipline, that burning diligence. It just hurts sometimes to be faithful. It just hurts to be consistent in life and service and ministry. It's hard. And that's where our faith is being molded and stretched and refined in the fire. And that's why it's so important. Take those challenges in faith. Don't look at yourself, but just step out as Peter did with Jesus on the water. Amen. Verse 20, And they gave Hebron to Caleb as Moses had said. Then he expelled them from there, the three sons of Anak, those giants we just read about. We've talked about that. But the children of Benjamin, and here we go, here's this starting statement, this testimony. The children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem, so the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. And the house of Joseph went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. So the house of Joseph sent men to spy out Bethel. We see an interesting kind of story here. Spied out the city, verse 24. Couldn't find where the entrance was. It was a stronghold. When the spies saw a man coming out of the city, they said to him, please show us the entrance to the city and we will show you mercy. So we showed them the entrance to the city. They struck the city with the edge of the sword, but they let the man and all his family go. They were faithful to their word as God told them to be. And here's interesting, uh, something very interesting. The name of the city was called what? Verse 23, 
Luz. So the man, being shown mercy, went to the land of the Hittites, built a city, and called its name, what? Luz, which is its name to its day. Short on time, but nonetheless, this is an interesting kind of occurrence, right? Israel's coming in. Everyone knows why they're there. City shut up tight, no way in. Meet this particular man. Promise him mercy. The grace of God is extended, you know, facing impending doom, judgment. The grace of God is given. He's free, right? What does he do? Does he respond to that grace? Does he say, hey, this God is good? I'm going to, you know, jump in with you guys and worship the Lord and whatever, repent from my lifestyle, whatever the case may be. No. He just goes to a different area and builds a city by the same name. Luz and Luz. And we see the same thing still today. You know, we see the grace of God just poured out and extended upon people that the Lord loves and that we love. And there just will be those who choose to not respond to that grace. It's a tough, tough observance. It's a tough thing. Keep fighting for them if they're in your life. Don't give up. While we still breathe, there's still opportunity. While we're still on earth, there's still a chance. Don't give up. But it's sad to see that choice. Verse 27, we read about Manasseh. Verse 29, Ephraim. Verse 30, Zebulun. Verse 31, the tribe of Asher. Naphtali in verse 33. And then Dan. The infamous tribe of Dan. We see over and over again in this last section the failure to, by faith, follow after the Lord. God says, let's go get them. And they say, well, I'm good. I'm good here. I'm content. I'm comfortable. I have enough. Most of the enemies are gone. I can resist the remnant, as it were. And we see so much of the same thing today. We're going to see what such a choice sentences us to. All the victory in, 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 in God, all the victory that God can offer, and that's all of it, right? All the victory in God that the Lord can offer and extends to us is ours. Freedom in Christ. That's our comparison. Free in Christ to live after him and to love him, to deny ourselves and take up our cross, to die to those idolatrous influences to sin and just say no. We're not slaves to sin anymore, but we're free to live radically for the Lord, to deal drastically with sinful influences and whatever the culture's into, whatever causes sin to creep into our minds, temptation to come our way. But it's going to be a fight, and it's a fight that we must choose to daily enter into and wage. It won't be easy. It takes labor and work and character and discipline and diligence. But how it leads to happiness, and we'll continue to see that. Father, continually remind us as we work our way through Judges that happiness lies right before us. Contentment, true joy, peace that passes all understanding. All the good stuff in God. Psalmist said that we're saved with benefits, Lord, and there are so many benefits of salvation. And we're going to find those benefits, Lord, as we make the choice to stand our ground and say, as Jesus declared, Lord, I will choose to be in this world, but not of it, not like it. Continue to give us, Lord, wisdom of what that looks like, what it means, how it works. And would your spirit, through your love, God, just enable us to make those choices, to distance ourselves, Lord, from what is evil, God. To not say, oh, it can't, and not say, oh, it won't. I'm strong enough. I can resist. But to trust you when you say it's got to go. It's not worth the pain and the problems and the stumbles, the consequences that come. It's just not worth it. 
It's baggage. Let it go. Lay it down. The sin that trips you up, the weight of idolatry that slows you down, just cast it aside. Life is so much better in the happiness of holiness. Grow us, God. Increase our faith right now so we can trust you and believe you. There is so much more for us, God. And Lord, we will be those and back our prayer up, this prayer of faith that we now make. Back it up with power, God. We will be those who choose wisely to live so carefully because it's just not worth it, God. Thank you, Lord, for the Israelites. Thank you, God, for being honest with us and speaking truth to us. Thank you for offering us, Lord, the, the promised life of blessing through Jesus. We love you. We thank you, Lord. We look forward to working our way, learning so much of ourselves, God, in your grace, your goodness, your kindness, and judges. In Jesus' name, let's say together, amen. And we say, glad you're here. God bless you guys. If you'd like some prayer, we'll be up front. Enjoy some fellowship before you go. God bless.